This podcast is sponsored by Exact Sciences, a leading provider of cancer screening and diagnostic tests. To learn more, visit exactsciences.com. Hello, welcome to Reopening Sardine. This is a five-episode series of The Corner Table, a podcast about food and drink in Madison, Wisconsin. The Corner Table is produced and hosted by me, Lindsay Christians, Cap Times food editor. And me, Chris Lay, an occasional Cap Times contributor and the podcast operations manager for Lee Enterprises. We approached John Gato and Philip Hurley, the owners of Sardine, about documenting the reopening of their restaurant with one key request. We wanted to talk to staff. Sardine went from 70 or so employees when it closed in 2020 to 38 as it prepared to reopen. The front of house would now be pooling tips without barbacks and server assistance. They'd be learning new dishes, new cocktails, and new ways of service. In this episode, we're talking to Susan Schuler, the general manager of Sardine, about how she handled the restaurant closing. We listen in as she coaches the front of house staff on masks and new sanitation rules, and we'll hear from staffers like Kelsey Burkett, the new bar manager, and a server named Sam about how they feel as they get ready to return. It's a deep dive into reopening a restaurant. Give a listen. Say your name, and this is the sound of my voice. Oh, my name is Susan Schuler, and this is the sound of my voice. First of all, your role here is general manager and wine director. All right. How long have you been with Sardine? I have been with Sardine since they opened in 2006. Is it like a tech startup? Do you know, like, were you employee number three or something? (laughs) (laughs) I was one of the first people that they brought into this space as it was being redone, and it it was a, a really big deal. I had used to work at Restaurant Magnus. Um, that was up on this, uh, like up on East Wilson Street, and um, I had a friend that was working at Marigold that said, you know, they're doing this. John and Philip are doing this restaurant down on Machinery Row, and you should check in with them. And um, yeah, it's been yeah, I hooked up with them early and told them that I would, you know, I could commit to a couple years, and we'll just kind of see where things go. And that was 16 years ago, so it's been going pretty good. <laughs> Were you working right before the pandemic shutdown? Do you remember that week right before? Oh, I replayed it in my mind a couple of times. It kind of was fast forward. Um, About two weeks uh, before we shut down, we had a manager's meeting and it was a talk about there's this thing called COVID-19 and it, it might affect restaurants. And I was like, oh, it really was, was the first like, I, like th- that I've ever even, ever even heard about it. Um, and then the next week, um, started hearing like California was out of toilet paper. And I was like, what is going on with this? We had another meeting, I would say that it was the Wednesday before we closed on Sunday, and we were talking about the fact that this was real, and it was really possible that COVID was real, it was coming, and still was something that I couldn't even like grasp or understand what, what was happening. Um, that we, you know, we wanted to slow down our purchasing and just be prepared for like whatever was going to come. Um, that was on a Wednesday. On Friday, we could feel that um, we there weren't as many people coming into the restaurant, and we had bought a whole bunch of disinfectant and like ran to like. Edward Don, our supply guy, was like completely out of that. We we're like running to Target to like purchase like everything we could, um, and we're just disinfecting and disinfecting and standing next to each other, talking without masks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> then it became like really real, um, and we could see that the number of guests that were coming in were fewer, um, and we were talking as a staff like we we can foresee that we're going to close like we can see this is coming like and we're guessing that, that oh maybe it might be mid next week this coming week maybe tuesday or wednesday and we made it as far as uh the next morning philip john and i got a letter to hang up and put on social media and hang up on the front door um, we talked to the staff um, there were a lot of tears all of us 
and we walked out the door. So that was all on Sunday. That was all on Sunday. It was just, I, I will never forget that drive home, uh, going oh home being like, I don't have a job. And so it was going from opening that, that morning, having a handful of people come in for brunch, and then having to make the decision, and everything just happened so fast. God. It was so fast. Yeah. yeah. Put stuff out, and then, like, like oh, geez. Yeah. yeah, it was over, and then everyone that we knew, the Madison restaurant community is tight. We all we all know each other, and I've been in the industry my entire uh, working career, so I know so many people. Everyone was hit. You know, it was just like unbelievable to know that basically everyone I know and everyone I cared about like lost their jobs, and we're completely unsure of like what does that mean? You know, like, and you can't just say, well, I guess this is happening in Madison and I can just like jump on an airplane and you know go s to another city another state another country like you <laughs> couldn't go anywhere and that was just like unbelievable to try to just process one of the things that made sardine a little different last year is that it did never pivoted to takeout and never oh. decided to do muscles on the go is like i don't know speaking like we're trying to keep the community safe yeah <laughs> i don't know if that would have been the best choice yeah i wonder what kind of things you were hearing from your employees and your staffers like questions or you know things that they were concerned about like what kinds of conversations were you having with them especially sort of in those early months well we, at the very beginning like the day of closing we got um, one of the group me like apps started where we were all able to kind of communicate together I can remember that m Monday or Tuesday there was just lots of conversation about uh, the challenges of getting on unemployment and different questions that people had and it was so useful for all of us to be able to use that um, as a resource to ask each other like how do you do this how, how do you make this happen if they needed information from me I had access to do that so we were able to you know get going on that um, and then we just kind of, every once in a while, someone would like send on the group me like, I'm thinking of you. And then a whole bunch of people would respond. Um, we had a couple times in the summer that we thought of like putting one of a big tent out in the parking lot and trying to, trying to do something. We wanted to, uh, you know, the idea of just not working wasn't even like a choice. We just wanted to get everyone back to work. Um, but each time we tried that, the COVID numbers in uh, Dane County just skyrocketed. The last time we were thinking about it was right when the students came back. And it was, and then like Dane County was like on fire when it came, it wasn't, it wasn't even a question to do. Our staff was very supportive of the idea of, they did not want to, return to work and be in an environment where they had to be around people that weren't wearing masks. We didn't feel pressure from them um, to get the place open and try to figure it out. With the takeout, uh, again, sardines food wouldn't be the best thing to like throw in the back seat of your car and drive 20 minutes to your house. It's just not the style of food for that. But really, when you look at the different businesses that are doing takeout, the you know they're trying to just you know keep their heads above water and bless them for like how hard they're trying. But there's a really minimal number of employees that you're able to to be able to keep uh, like on the payroll at that yeah. time. And when Sardine closed, um, we had about around 70 people on payroll here. And if we were to do a takeout thing, we would have needed six, <laughs> you know, like to put it in perspective. Yeah. yeah. I, I was wondering for you, what were the things that you most missed? Um, people, like you can't be in this business and not enjoy people. The majority of the staff that has worked here um, has been here between five or eight years, and I would say um, we have a good handful that have been here for 10 years. We're a tight family. It was the hardest just watching us all. Like these are people that I see every single day. You know, sardines open seven days a week. We, um, I've seen people. Um, uh, get married. I've seen them start families. I've seen them go through hardships and uh, celebrations and having that distance like the, the physical distance that was required was uh, really difficult and just wondering how everyone was doing. Baking in all the stress of you know the 
personal experiences people are having with their families going through this, you know, distances and things like that. And then also not having any security professionally, Yeah. you know, saying like, we're closing and when will we, will we be back? We don't know. We, we don't know. Yeah. And we were thinking um, worst case scenario. And I think we were on like worst case scenario was like two months. Like, oh, and yeah. I was like, oh yeah, totally. Oh my God, please don't let it be too much. I know. <laughs> too long, long. Like that. I can't even, I can't even wrap my brain around that. But that was really where we were like, like worst case scenario, maybe a couple months. Did you take up any hobbies or do like <laughs> like learn anything new during the pandemic? I want to be the person that says like I started making like Greek statues or you know like became really good Can at you math. Now? <laughs> like I really like I like solved some major math problems. Like I wish I could say that. Um, I I started doing some more cooking at home. I definitely did that. Um, a lot of that was like budget related, <laughs> budget related cooking, I would say. I started working on different like skills with um, like um, iMovie and making different videos because I knew that at some point when we came back, I wanted to polish up my skills with being able to do postings on social media. So that was something that I looked into. But to be honest, there was a lot of like, laying down and um, going from I made a rule that for myself that like the bedroom is where you lay down <laughs> and the, the couch is where you sit up I love this that this was a that, good rule. that was my that was my big rule you can't just lay there and then migrate and yeah. lay over there and then lay over there so I did a, a lot of Netflix a lot of laying around um, Tiger King was right at the gate. Yeah, like, I, was... got in, I got introduced to Tiger King. <laughs> got introduced, like, know all those things. Know all those things now. <laughs> nice. I, I feel like I heard from some of the staff that did have to go back or, you know, were going to go back, like, especially, like, last summer when nobody was vaccinated yet. Like, it was a scary thing, but people felt like, I, I need the money or yeah. I need to work or whatever it is. Um, but it was a complicated thing. And I, I still didn't even feel comfortable going to restaurants at that point, really, because Me I didn't too. want to put anybody at risk. Me too. Me too. So it just, it seemed like a kind of a complicated calculus to, to The make. math made no sense with it. Like, the science made no sense with it. Like, you had to wear your mask everywhere, except if you were in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Then you could take it off. And like, and that just, and that was scary. It was really scary to know that you would be in that environment um, for your full-time job, but that, yeah, you had a lot of like, financially you had to try to figure out a way. I think that like a normal migration for a restaurant worker would be to look towards retail, but retail was destroyed too. So it's just kind of like what your normal talents are as like a people person, uh, working with individuals, uh, working with sales, getting to know products, you know, doing that kind of thing. That would be the normal way to turn. But then it was just kind of like all the doors that would be the natural, like what your natural talents are, um, are closed. Yeah. And I mean, the numbers didn't make sense. And then also from my standpoint as a consumer, like I mean, coming like I, I come to restaurants to feel good, you know, to be like in, you know, not at home, not at whatever, and yes. then you know, to feel a little carefree, and then to come here and then know that this is, you know, where everyone else is has their mask off to eat, and it's you can't like if somebody you know coughs or sneezes in the background, it's like everything just kind of clenches, cringes. yeah, <laughs> and you can't. I mean, that just it ruins the experience. telling these folks today to get them ready for service again? <laughs> <laughs> well, I am so pleased to say that all of those folks out there, not one of them is a new face. And that's um, the my bartenders and the service staff are doing the front of the house tonight. And um, I'll be able to start Sardine um, with all friendly faces around me that are all hoping for the same thing. And so that is just a blessing. and. A, is awesome. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about um, 
uh, COVID safety and how to be able to make our guests feel safe. Our staff is entirely vaccinated. So uh, we're very, very proud of that. And, and I want them to know that that is what's happening too. And it, it makes it very different with like how we'll approach moving forward, that if somebody is exposed to COVID outside of here, um, it makes it very different than if we weren't vaccinated as how we would go as a business. And so um, it, it's so helpful for us that everyone's, that we're all on the same page with that. Um, and we'll just have to kind of talk about a lot of things that that are the things that we need to do in the restaurant to make our customers that come in here that again may be fully vaccinated but it's that like untying of that knot of like of the knot of the masks that we've been wearing of being able to feel comfortable because I'm sure that you've done this too or you're like you're watching TV and like two people are a little too close together and you're just like you're too close we're, you know like it's it's getting everyone to slowly get back to normal and to allow everyone to do that at their own pace. And so we'll talk about like how we approach a table and, you know, ask like, are, would you like me to pour the wine for you? Or are you more comfortable pouring that yourself? I you know, love that. to be gauge, and we're always trying to gauge what kind of service the guest wants from us. And now it's just like another layer on top of that. It's what kind of service do you want in this, COVID era that we're hopefully coming to the end of that makes you most comfortable. Maybe you're looking forward to us coming into the table and taking the plates away and filling up your glass of wine, or maybe you would just feel better if we set the bottle on the table and let you take care of that yourself. That's a whole different way of looking at what service is and was. It's rethinking it. Yeah. yeah. It's not going to be as as direct, maybe. Like, it won't be like you're trying to read people and, like, figure out who is going to be the person who wants to just have, like, as minimal contact as possible. Yeah. And other people that are, like, like they know they're vaxxed. You don't necessarily have to walk into every single room like, hi, I'm, I'm vaxxed, you know, and, like, right. you know. Which I've been read. doing. Yeah. I've actually been, like, every server I encounter, I'm like, hi, I'm very vaccinated just because I'm so <laughs> worried that they're, that they're going to think that I'm a threat to them. Yeah. We'll have to ask people, and, you know, like, and that's how we, like, we're not mind readers, and but I think that there's, again, the staff is very good at what they do, and a part of it is mind reading. They are good at, like, reading people, but there there is going to be the point of, you know, at, like at, with the bottle of wine, you ask. Yeah. Another thing that we'll be talking about is the term, and I've heard a lot of this about policing, uh, that staff feel uncomfortable that they have to police uh, the people walking around without masks and such. I've been working at Gates and Brovey helping out with their takeout program. One of the things that I, an example would be um, going out to a car where somebody's sitting in, all their windows are up. Um, they don't have a mask on, not that it matters, they're in their car. Um, I have food for them and they point at their back seat and they want me to open up their back door and the only place that I can put the food is in between the baby seats and so I have to physically lean like into the car. I'm not going to do that. All I have to do is let them know it's not a great idea that I lean into your car and you can see them at that moment the wheels turn and they're like, I can't believe I just asked you to do that. You know, it's it's like it's not everyone is it's it's not always an arm wrestling situation. Sometimes it's informing. The very few times someone would walk into that restaurant without their mask on, it's because they forgot it. I don't have you done this? Have you gone? I went to Woodman's once and I grabbed a cart and I started walking in and I realized I didn't have my mask on, which was equivalent to like thinking like like not having your pants on. And I was just horrified. So um, informing is the word that we're gonna be using more than policing. This podcast is sponsored by Exact Sciences, a leading provider of cancer screening and diagnostic tests. To learn more, visit exactsciences.com. What were some things that you remembered from that first front of house meeting that struck you? There was a certain, not, not discomfort. You know, it felt like everyone was still shaking a lot of rust off. Not just in the getting back into a professional space like that and knowing that you're going to have to change 
whatever muscle memory might have made it through the pandemic, you know, from working in this place, but just socializing with each other on, on a friend level and just, you know, watching, you know, kind of people mill about and greet each other after, you know, who knows how long. At that point, the vast majority of everyone was either fully vaccinated or very much on their way to being fully vaccinated. You know, there were, you know, questions about masks and like, you know, it's like, is it okay if I take my mask off and we talk? Are you guys okay if I have masks? Can we talk to you? Yes. yes. Yeah, just everyone having to navigate the new social world that we're going to have to be in where there isn't really any, you know, Miss Manners has, hasn't really issued a handbook on how to <laughs> operate in post-COVID America. Much less in, in a dining situation from a, a serving standpoint. Yeah. And it, it's interesting, too, because like you and I are both vaccinated. So when we would do interviews with John and Philip, they are both fully vaccinated. And we all sort of talked with each other and said, we're comfortable taking our masks off. But when all the employees came in, everybody was masking. And you have a lot of like, is it OK if I hug you? Um, just like before, would you guys are so super good at Servers will read the tables for the style of service that that table wants you to deliver to them. This now reading of the table just has another layer. It's a layer of like what makes this person feel comfortable being in this space. Um, the most broad takeaway that I had from from that first front of house meeting was finding ways to address the comforts of customers. Um, with you are unsure of what your guests want to be able to feel comfortable, um, you're going to have to ask. And so we're going to be asking our guests, like, this is what we're doing. And, and my goal is to give you, you know, generous, kind, great, great service. But I, I'm going to need you to guide me a little bit, too. We're vaccinated. So there's a certain level of, like, what the CDC says is A-OK. And then there's stuff that the CDC is going to say is OK, but people still aren't necessarily going to be comfortable with it. And so it's making sure that everyone's boundaries are met. And then also, Susan was talking about if a customer gets up and, you know, walks around without a mask on, your knee-jerk reaction might be to assume that there is, like, a larger statement being made in that and to, you know, have, you know, a, a more defensive approach to it. But it's just reframe it entirely as address it in, in a much more uh, constructive way. I remember she used the word education, like yes. educate, don't police. Exactly. Um, if someone gets up from the table, it could be as easy as saying, oh, don't forget your mask, opposed to you're supposed to be wearing a mask when in transit. You know, there's there's different ways that we can approach. But you guys are not in charge of policing anybody. I don't want you to feel like you are. One of the things that also struck me about the front of house meeting was when they were talking about the changes related to COVID that would be in like the staff areas. So there could only be two people in one of the rooms, you know, the staff room where they would maybe change normally at a time. You can't leave stuff in your locker like maybe you used to. And you can't take a long time like doing your makeup because there can only be so many people, you know, at, at a time in that room. And this is even though the staff is fully vaccinated um, as of, I think, the first I think the first weekend in June is when everybody is like fully post two weeks. I started to think about what it would be like to be a server in this place and like how the ways that you've always done it have to change both behind the scenes and at the tables. ideas, the kind of service we want to bring and revisit things that all of you already know, um, but it'll give us a chance to rethink them, because every time you go over them and the way we've been going over them, we think, wow, we can maybe, these are things we do really well, we have maybe areas we can just even improve on, and uh, we think some of the operations and changes we can make. One of the things that they did was they opened up a window in the kitchen, a sardine, like a, there's, so when you walk back toward the kitchen at Sardine, like you pass the big thing of oysters on your left and you're walking back toward the entrance to the kitchen, you'll see on your left there that there's an opening where they can slide food through. That never existed before. Everybody had to go around that really tight corner. And so every time somebody would do that, they'd have to say corner, 
corner, corner, corner. And it's really important because I looked at the space where they had been putting up plates before, and it was it was very small, which meant that you'd have situations where you have a table of like six people and two or three people's food would come out, and then you'd have to wait for a little while, and then two or three more people's food comes out. And we all know that that is an awkward situation because you don't know whether you could start eating or not, and you're asking for permit. Like, is it okay if I start eating? No, is it awkward? I don't know. But now they are they have this pass through. And they're working as a team in the front of the house where not people will have sections, yes, but it's, it's all the tips are going to be pooled. So they're all working together to drop plates at the same time. Okay, so we're going to be a pool house and we're going to be working as a team. Um, there are sections and the goal is during this time for us to be able to figure out how to make that work really well. Um, I think you would all agree with me that it doesn't make sense to have someone getting just crushed up front while three people are standing in the back drinking coffee, angry that they don't have tables, and frustrated with that. Um, we are I did a story several years ago when uh, restaurants were talking a lot about getting rid of tipping. One of the things that I heard from servers about the pooling, the tip pooling, it was described to me by one server as like, you know, that one kid when you all had a group project in school who didn't pull their weight, there's always like a couple of those people who like when you have a table and it's you're they're ordering extra bottles of wine and you're running all night and you're and whatever. And then you get a big tip. You've worked really hard for that tip. Putting it everything into a pool means you really have to have a lot of trust for your for the other employees, and you have to have a lot of collaboration among the front of house. And Susan talked about that in the meeting, about how people were going to need to work together and really be a tight knit team. But in the case of a restaurant like this, where they're opening at fifty percent capacity, part of it has to do also with just guaranteeing that everyone is going to take home a decent wage when you can only fill half the dining room. It was, it was interesting as we sort of attended some of these behind the scenes meetings to see who was like open to talking with us and who was maybe a little bit nervous. Um, there was one uh, staffer named Sam. I've been here for 10 years. Yes, I guess. Okay. <laughs> who I approached and I kind of had to talk him into talking with me. Are you recording this? You're not recording this. But then You're once I did, he. He had such a generous spirit. He seemed so happy to be back, um, and he ended up giving a really great little interview. What did you miss? Oh my God, I miss people. I miss, I miss people. I miss, I miss my life. This is my life. This is not, this is not a job. This is, this is, this is. is, This is my place, my life. I, 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 I know everyone that comes here. I know pretty much everyone. Not you know, even if they, do, even if I know them, I, I get to know them. I, I like their stories. I like to share my my events, my happening, even small things. And and they share the same with me. And they will, they will, they will, they will get married here. They will have their first date here. They would just have their kids and they just, they bring their kids here. They get pregnant and come here. They would do, it's a life. I miss the customs. I want to see here, here, and we can see, we can see happiness. We can see Mother's Day was like, was like nothing that you've seen anywhere else. It's so busy, I bet. Not, yes, yes, but the vibe, you know, seeing family, seeing, families and and kids and their mothers and graduations and all the everything happened here i've seen everything 
funerals. I've seen funerals here. And even that by itself, it was just, it was, it was a celebration. Every day, every day, every event, every table, it was a celebration here. It's not, it's not, it's not, nothing, nothing like this place. Yeah, nothing like this place. And, 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 and the best part of it, that we, we work for amazing people. The owners, the management, the staff that they choose, I got rid of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so, you know, it's beautiful. That's it. Yeah. I asked Kelsey Burkett, the bar manager at Sardine, to talk about what her pandemic has been like and what she's looking forward to now. I, I didn't work for the first, maybe, for about the first four or five months. Um, I was on unemployment and didn't work. I didn't feel safe working um, during those months. And I just, I, yeah, I was very cautious. I've done a couple events, but it's been forever since I've had a steady stream of bartending. And uh, yeah, I'm just thrilled. <laughs> We have so many people at Sardine and Gates and Brovi too. Like we're very regular based uh, businesses and um, people that come in weekly or bi-weekly, you know, uh, that we'd see all the time and are just really good friends. And I just haven't seen a lot of those people in a year and it, it's going to be so great. I think there's going to be a lot of weeping, <laughs> like seeing a lot of those people kept in contact. Um, with some people too, but you know, over like social media and stuff, it's not the same. So I'm just excited to see familiar faces sitting down at the bar again. I am a little worried about, um, yeah, I guess just the whole COVID monster of, you know, making sure that the employees and the guests both feel safe. Um, I think a lot of it is going to be kind of just working with each other and making sure people feel comfortable. I think everyone has really different comfort levels, so I think we just need to really be, like Susan was saying earlier, like educating people about what's best so that like we are being as careful as we can be in that way that like every single person that comes in here and every single employee that works here is as comfortable as they can be and feel safe because I've been in those situations in this past year where you like are suddenly in a situation where you're like, ooh, I don't feel great about this and it's the worst feeling, you know. You're just anxious, you don't feel great, and so I just don't want anyone to feel like that if we can avoid it, so. This has been The Corner Table, Reopening Sardine, a podcast about food and drink in Madison, Wisconsin, produced by the Capital Times. Patrick Christians composed and performs our music. Eric Lawrenson edits the show. Links to relevant content, as well as ways you can contact us directly, can be found in the show notes. If you missed the first episode of Reopening Sardine, check that out. In that episode, we talked with John and Philip about what it took to shut down three busy restaurants and the challenges of reopening. Subscribe to The Corner Table on your app of choice. We are on Spotify, Stitcher, and Apple Podcasts. And get more food coverage at The Cap Times. We have a beautiful patio package out with 250 patios in the Dane County area. Ah, oh, you love a patio. <laughs> if you liked this episode, The Corner Table also has a hundred plus episodes for you to discover about everything from ballpark food and cream puffs to knife sharpening and junk food. Until next week, I'm Chris Lay. And I'm Lindsay Christians. Our wish for you this week is a popsicle. A pudding pop, a fruit pop, a yogurt pop, a push pop, if that's your fancy just something cold on a stick. Stay cool out there, everybody. (laughs) Cheers. This podcast is sponsored by Exact Sciences, a leading provider of cancer screening and diagnostic tests. To learn more, visit exactsciences.com.